a great many years now, I have been saying that the big development or evolutionary step within the human race that must occur is the concept of I can have me and I can have you too at the very same time. This implies that connection and autonomy are not mutually exclusive. Instead, they are integrated. But the honest truth is that for the majority of people living on the planet, and I mean the vast majority, they're not integrated. In fact, a great split exists within them between a part of self that wants autonomy and freedom, which is what it's calling it, at any cost, and a part that wants connection at any cost. You couldn't get more at odds than that. It's important to note that the part that will fight for autonomy at any cost is fighting for its own independent best interests. Now, when it is fighting for its own independent best interests, that feels somatically like a fight for freedom. It's not an actual fight for freedom. It's a fight for self. That being said, because it feels like a fight for freedom, most people alive today have an internal split between the commitment to connection and the commitment to freedom. This means that humanity itself as a collective consciousness has the same split. To understand the concept of a split deeper, watch my video titled Fragmentation, the Worldwide Disease. You can also keep a lookout for the video that I'm going to be doing shortly, which teaches you how to work with aspects of consciousness, what many people call parts. To understand this split, we have to go back to how the split was made. And as usual, for this, we need to go back to our childhood experience. A child is born as an individual separate self. It has an identity, therefore. Now, boundaries, what they really are, is a definition of self. Nothing more, nothing less. When we say that a child has a self, what we mean is that they have thoughts. They have feelings. These are separate from everyone else's. They have their own desires. They have their own needs. They have their own talents. They have their own shortcomings. They have their own interests. They have their own best interests. Now, what I need you to think back on is how your parents, how your family, your peers, how your teachers, your society or culture at large responded to those aspects of yourself. How did they respond to your thoughts, your feelings, your needs, your desires, your interests, your shortcomings, your talents, your best interests? For example, were they acknowledged, accommodated, ignored, or turned against? Were there consequences for them? Up to this point in history, the vast, 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 vast majority of parents don't actually, and this goes for adults, not just parents, don't actually see a child as an individual being to be unwrapped. Instead, they see it as something to be molded into what they want it to become. What I'm going to do is give you a seemingly benign example so that you can kind of get the grasp of the scope of this issue. I want you to imagine that there's a little kid, and this little kid is sitting in a high chair, Mom sitting by this kid in the high chair is trying to feed it lunch because it's lunchtime. Mom says, you need to eat your food. The child's truth is that he or she is not hungry, so the child refuses to eat. Mom does not acknowledge the child's truth, and so she force feeds the child or tells the child that he or she can't come down out of the high chair until the food is finished. Not only has mom's anger been felt as a loss of closeness, which is acutely painful, the message is this. I will not accept that part of you, the truth that you are not hungry. Therefore, to maintain connection and closeness with me, you must abandon that truth and be what I tell you to be, which is hungry, or at the very least, eat, even if you aren't hungry. This child is at a crossroads. The child gets to choose to abandon his or her sense of self in that moment for the sake of feeling close to mom, or fight for his or her sense of self, and as a consequence, lose closeness with mom. This is the kind of scenario that causes the child's boundaries to become unhealthy. To understand more about this, watch my video titled Personal Boundaries versus Oneness, How to Develop Healthy Boundaries. Now let's say that this overall societal belief that a child is meant to be molded exists as a kind of sliding scale. And everybody's parents, all the adults in society, fall somewhere on this scale. This means that to differing degrees of severity, we are trained the following. That in order to have closeness or connection with the social group, with the people that matter more to us, and by the way, this is so 
critical, you have to understand the following. Human beings, a physical human, their need for connection and closeness with a social group is survival. It is actually a more important need for a physical human than food or water because closeness with a social group was the way that it got food and water. We are, after all, relationally dependent for a big part of our lives, if not all of it. So our number one need, which is to be close and connected, we are trained, is conditional upon us giving up ourselves, or at the very least, parts of ourselves. In other words, we must abandon or let go of or betray our own thoughts, interests, feelings, needs, wants, preferences, and best interests. To have them, we can't have ourselves at the same time. This becomes the only context through which we understand social relationships. This means that we start to associate connection, that thing we desperately need, with things like self-sacrifice, with things like obligation, with duty, with being controlled, <laughs> with losing our sense of self, with imprisonment. Oh, I forgot to mention one, which I have to add. The constant effort of inauthenticity. This is actually the origin of the belief in me versus them. So does this mean that this really is the reality of our social relationships? No, but we've been trained into it. So you can understand this split inside yourself deeper. I want you to take a look at both sides of this split. We're going to begin with a part of you that is completely committed to connection. The part of you that is completely committed to connection understands intimately that so many of your needs, physical, mental, and emotional, are in fact dependent upon connection with other people, connection with other things. <laughs> it's not the one that carries the pain inherent in connection. The other one does. It's the one that carries the pain of the lack of it, which is that absolute starvation of isolation and loneliness. If this part of self, the one that is committed to connection, can't get enough connection through people, it's going to orient itself towards other things, things like animals, food, objects, literally anything it can find connection with. This is not an aspect of self that is guarded. It's an aspect of self that is open and constantly bidding for connection. This part holds the universal truth of interdependence that it is connected to everything. It understands that it has to be attuned to other people and beings, and that aloneness is the result of not considering others. It's at this point we have to look at the downside of this part. The downside of this part is is a complete codependent. I mean, complete codependent. This part will resort to all kinds of coping mechanisms if the threat of loss of connection is ever on the table. And these coping mechanisms pretty freaking extreme. It will not acknowledge anything that threatens its sense of closeness. This includes incompatibility. For this reason, it often suffers from denial and enables dysfunctional behavior and gaslights itself and others. This is the part that's always going to tell the story in favor of the positive. For example, let's say that dad came home and is blackout drunk. This is the part that's going to say, well, you know, he's had a really stressful month at work. This is the part of us that will abandon self immediately if it ever risks the loss of connection. It's going to self-sacrifice instantaneously and not even register it as a self-sacrifice. Because to this part, it really isn't. This part's number one personal self-centered motive is connection. It's willing to sacrifice anything for the sake of having that connection. Personal truth, one's feelings, its own thought, anything. So <laughs> it's going to put those on the chopping blocks like this. The truth that's inherent in this part is that there's actually no such thing as genuine altruism. <laughs> there's not a philanthropic act because its main motivation, self-centeredly, is a sense of connection. Then even if it seems like it's doing things for other people constantly and self-sacrificing constantly, it's in fact doing that for its own primary best interest. This is the part that is never going to give up on anyone. It's the one that's going to stay in the abusive relationship. It's the one that's going to, no matter how dysfunctional the family is, keep saying things like, you know, our family's really great and we've got our problems, but all families do. This part is the one making Hollywood films about all you need is love and where there's a will to be in a relationship, there's a way. Now here's the thing. 
the way that this part primarily goes about getting connection with other people and other things is by disconnecting from other parts within you that threaten connection or that it's been trained to threaten connection. Therefore, it is never actually entering into relationships with the totality of you. This is where you can break free from the ignorance of this particular part. If you're not ever entering into relationships with the totality of you because its primary way of getting connection is to cut off from other aspects of you, then you're not really being fully there in relationships, are you? You can't therefore call it a relationship. The sad truth is that its connection with others is in fact an overlay. It's alone in its perception of connection. This part of you is rather like Buddy from the movie Elf. The part of you that wants freedom, this is the opposite side of this primary split, part of you that wants freedom doesn't actually want freedom. Yet again, it wants autonomy. What that really means is it wants to live in alignment with your true needs, wants, desires, preferences, interests, best interests, talents, purpose. <laughs> you. This is the part that has been really, really hurt and disillusioned by relationships. This is the part that feels controlled, but it's going to tell you I'm being controlled by all these other people when in fact it's not as being controlled by the other part of the split. That one which we just met, yeah, that's the one that's controlling it. That's the one that's like, you know what, sorry, if I enter into a relationship with you, like, we're going to get rejected, so. <laughs> when you have an early childhood experience that bringing parts of your truth into the table get you rejected, it can kind of feel like relationships are fragile. Um, another feeling that I think is normal for this part of self is to feel like in relationships you're surrounded by like an electric fence. You go left, you get shocked. You go front, you get shocked. You go back, you get shocked. And so this creates this feeling like relationships are like a Fabergé egg. Not only are they so fragile that absolutely anything could crush them, but once they get crushed, there's no such thing as repair because there's no possible way you can reconstruct all of the pieces. This part holds the pain of constantly being suppressed. It's conscious that if you have to change yourself to gain love and closeness, you're not actually close and you're not actually loved. This part is also conscious of the extreme pressure of everyone's needs of it. It sees its existence as a never-ending toil of being used by people. It doesn't feel like a person, it feels like a tool to be used. And it hates this. <laughs> Responsibility is a huge pressure belonging to this part. This part of you believes, I have to be responsible for myself and them. But it hates this, so it says no to being responsible for other people. Way it says yes to being responsible for itself, is because it actually wants to find a way to meet all of its needs itself and not have to depend on anyone at all. This desire of this part, because of being so hurt by people, to not depend on anyone for anything, to be completely independent, responsible for only itself, is actually the real reason, <laughs> the shadow reason, why it's interested in self-development and spirituality. <laughs> oh, that's so sad. Yeah, it's really interested in any type of methodology which will lead it into more and more and more independence from anything and anyone. On the flip side, this part, because of all of this pain that it has so obviously suffered at the hands of connection, it's not in denial. It already sees itself as incredibly alone and also in pain. So because of this, it doesn't really risk what the other one risks by becoming aware of reality. Therefore, this is the one that's going to be the most on board with shadow work. <laughs> this is also the part looking for answers, because it's incredibly powerless to knowing the answer to remedy the painful way it is in relationships. Another thing that's interesting about this part of you is that it doesn't bid. What I mean by bid is there's ways to kind of pull for connection or to do things so that you get connection. It doesn't do this. It tends to be pretty aloof and avoidant. Because if it bids, all of a sudden the power is in the other person's hands to respond or not respond to that bid. And the one thing that this part wants to do is avoid anyone else being in control, like literally ever. Having complete control over everything is the only way that it sees that it's going to live a life without pain. The only way that it can achieve feel-good anything. Because of this, there is one way that this part stays safe in relationship, and that's transaction. When a relationship is clear and transactional, all of a sudden that's safe. This part thinks that if there's a conflict between you and another person, that you will always lose the fight. 
This part is completely fed up. I mean, literally can't stand anymore the feeling of pushing itself sideways. To sum up the world view that this aspect of you has, it's that it lives in a shark tank. Its truth is that everyone is only out for themselves. And I can't say that its observation of that is entirely false, can I? This is what we're trying to change. But here's the thing. This is where the cycle gets repeated. This part of you is going to see that everyone's out for themselves, and it's going to decide that because everyone's out for themselves, there's no option but to fend for itself. And by doing so, it steps into the very same pattern that it's suffering from. All right, everyone's fending for themselves, so I'm just going to care about me and mine. I don't want you to forget that this part is the one that has been rejected over and over and over and over again so that the other one can get into a relationship. So the overwhelming message that it continues to receive is this. If I go into a relationship as the real me, no one will ever want me, and instead they will hurt me. Because of this, it sees relationship as pain. If it were convinced that never having a relationship was the best answer, it would have gone there a long time ago. For this part, having a relationship with people is like eating poisoned water. It's a, I hate you so much for the fact that I need this. Unlike the other one, it feels like being alone is better than being trapped, but being alone sucks, which is why it ever agrees to going into a relationship in the first place. Unlike the other part, this one will viciously fight for its needs and best interests. It will fight for its self. It will also criticize the hell out of a person in a relationship in the hope that the other person will change so as to put it out of pain. This criticism is, of course, an attempt to control the other person's behavior. Now, this is where it can get really super confusing, right? Because when this part takes over, what happens is you start to act like a complete narcissist. So you've just flipped from being a complete codependent that just gives yourself up in every way for the sake of the connection to suddenly being a narcissistic person. Woo! It's also important to know about this part. It's really oriented towards what it doesn't want in relationship, whereas the other one's oriented towards what it does want in relationship. This part of you is rather like Scrooge from A Christmas Carol. When you have this split, there's going to be a downward spiral in your relationships that repeats over and over and over and over again. So you can completely understand it. I'm going to illustrate this spiral for you. <laughs> That connection committed part of you is the one that takes over and seeks out a relationship because you feel so alone. The thing is, is that it's not going to do this in a straightforward way, bringing all of itself into the relationship. Instead, the way it's going to go about doing this is it's going to assess the person in front of it that it's interested in getting into a relationship with. It's going to ascertain that person's needs, feelings, wants, desires, interests, preferences. It's going to get rid of anything of itself that might conflict with that. So you're actually entering into the relationship on completely false premise, but you're not conscious of it. Because this part doesn't see it as a loss of self or a self-sacrifice at all. After all, it's getting its number one need met, which is the need for connection. Because it does this, I'll become anything you want me to be. The other person on the other side is like, oh my god, I just found my soulmate. This is the most amazing person I've ever met in my life. It's like they're perfect for me. I mean, it's almost too good to be true, because it is. What you were doing is showing the other person you wanted that relationship with only what would guarantee you closeness with them. Only what would not end in rejection. So what happens when that relationship becomes secure? This is when all hell breaks loose, because there's a relaxation that occurs within the part that was committed to getting that connection. It already has it. It's at this point that all the stuff that that part stuffed underneath the floorboards comes bursting out of the floorboards. Suddenly that other part we met, remember the part that's committed self, that's been rejected and delegated to that place underneath the floorboards? Now it comes up and it takes over. This part contains all the parts that you decided to disown in this particular process of getting to know and connect with this particular person. Those parts now come forward because they were suppressed in order for the other one to secure the relationship. They start screaming for freedom. They start demanding for their needs to be met and for the other person to act in their best interest, because they haven't been. They fight for themselves against the person they love. The other person now feels duped. For example, suddenly you go from a person who says you're responsible to being completely irresponsible. You go from being gorgeous to letting yourself go. 
You go from saying you're a financial provider to suddenly expecting your partner to financially provide for you. You go from loving to constantly critical. The person you are now is literally nothing like the person you entered into the relationship as. All the ways you actually feel, all the ways you actually think, the needs you actually have, and the ways you go about trying to meet those needs and the interests you actually have, basically causes a complete destruction of the relationship because the whole relationship was built on pretense. It's at this point, by the way, that you usually get mad at the other person because the other person starts rejecting you. Of course they do. If somebody walked into a used car lot and that car salesman said, this is a red car and that's what they were looking for and 10 seconds later it starts chipping and it's a blue car, do you think they're going to have the same attitude towards that car? No, this is the same way that your partners feel with you. That's not what they got into the relationship for. <laughs> so expecting them to unconditionally love you when you do that little shift on them is not particularly fair. Obviously at this point, this relationship starts to become one of conflict. It starts to become one where all that is obvious is all the incompatibilities that were never seen in the first place because they were never presented in the first place. <laughs> this is where ruptures start to happen on the daily in a relationship and both partners are going what the hell happened to my perfect relationship? You can see this split that we've been talking about very clearly in yourself anytime you feel like you have to choose connection, closeness, or social harmony versus your own best interests. Now here's the thing, it's really tempting to think that it's your best interests versus the other person's best interests. It actually isn't. It's your best interests versus your best interests. It's the best interest belonging to your own two parts being pitted against each other. In other words, you feel this split anytime your own best interest of fill in the blank conflicts with your own best interest of connection. This split within you was created to accommodate for uncomplimentary needs. Not because they actually are uncomplimentary, but because you've been trained to see them as uncomplimentary. Up until now, What's been happening is that your need for autonomy could not exist in the same time and place as your need for connection. Each part also keeps you safe from the opposite threat. Your connection part keeps you safe from isolation. Your freedom part keeps you safe from the loss of self. But the time has come to recognize the split within yourself and within humanity so that we may integrate them and create a world in which freedom and connection are one. What I am inviting you into today through the recognition of this split is a reality in a world where we can have our self and have other people at the very same time. Have a good week.